our prayer and that's our faith. And if there's any one of us came into this house struggling to accept that truth, I pray that you would minister to us by your grace this morning. If there's anyone that's yet struggling to make that declaration in full faith, won't you reach their hearts this morning? If there's anyone who believes what they're saying this morning, I pray that, Lord, you will continue to show yourself as faithful because we, like Sarah of old, have deemed you faithful who promised. You are worth your praise and of glory. We thank you that this nation of Kenya belongs to you. It is safely in your hands. There is no power of hell or scheme of man that can pluck us out of your plan. So glorify your name as we get into this season, O oh God, even into the electioneering period, Lord Jesus. Right after these festivities, we pray that, Lord, you would show yourself strong in this nation because the nation of Kenya belongs to God and no one can undo that. This is our prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, celebrate the name of Jesus who is worthy. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the King of Kings. And as we sit down, put your hands together one more time. Celebrate Jesus for the worship team. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you and do you good. In Jesus' name, Bona Yesu Asifiwe. Bona Yesu Asifiwe. If I could get just a little bit of the bass shaved off. I sound a bit um, <laughs> heavy on the bass. You could just shave it off for me. I will be very grateful. My name is Brian Mashigadi. I'm born again, and Jesus is Lord over my life this morning i am so glad to stand in the presence of god and his people it is truly the honor of my life to serve god here at this AKZ under bishop dr jimmy and pastor alice kimani who are not in the house today but they send their love and their greetings do you receive them do you receive their greetings amen amen thank you so much we want to go right into the word of god this morning should i say to you merry christmas Merry Christmas and Happy Jamhuri Day. Please turn to your neighbor and wish them a happy Jamhuri Day. Yes, turn to another one. Let them know that leo ni siku ya Jamhuri kwa kweli. Ni siku ambayo tumefanyika kwa Jamhuri kuu ya Kenya. Amen. Are you glad that you're Kenyan? I really hope you are. It would be so sad to preach to people on Jamhuri Day to a congregation that is just cannot wait to leave the country and go and settle elsewhere. <laughs> you can't wait. You're doing everything in your power to just leave this God-forsaken place. But I want to bring some good news to you that that is not the true testimony of this nation. The Lord thinks highly of this land. He has good plans for us, plans to give us a future and a hope. If you think the nation of Kenya is going to end after the 2022 election, you've got something else coming. It's not going to happen in Jesus' name. This nation shall continue to outlive generations in Jesus' name. We shall grow better and better because there is a remnant that is calling on the name of the Lord and is seeking the face of the Lord as of necessity because Kenya belongs to Jesus. Do you want to try to taste that on your mouth as you say it? Kenya belongs to Jesus. Come on, say it with a bit of conviction. Kenya belongs to Jesus. Do you believe it? Amen. Let's continue to pray and to trust God as we get into the festivities. As um, our preacher last Sunday, Triple H, reminded us, wow, as um, Triple H reminded us that you cannot afford to sleep. You are on assignment. So as you go out into the festivities, as we continue to pray and to talk politics and all those things, let's remember that we are on assignment. We cannot be asleep. We are on assignment. Today I want to talk briefly share briefly with us on a topic called God on time. God on time. God on time. We're going to read from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1. It's quite lengthy. I don't think I'm going to read all of it. We have Luke chapter 1. There's two portions of it. Luke chapter 1 from verse 5 to verse 25. And then Luke chapter 1 from verse 26 all the way to verse 38. I'm going to just try and summarize this so that we don't read all of it. We're going to come to that in just a minute. But the first part, the first portion as we look at God on time is the story of John the Baptist, the story of his father John, uh, of his father Zachariah, sorry, and his mother Elizabeth. Sawa, sawa. 
So there's John the Baptist, that's the, sto- that's the person we are looking at. But then there's his father, Zacharias. <laughs> and then there's his mother, Elizabeth. And then the second portion of the story is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And then there's his father, Joseph. And there's his mother, Mary. And that's what we're going to be sharing about today. God on time. It starts by saying, verse 5, reading in the New King James, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a king, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughters of the, of the daughters of Aaron, and her name, was, her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before the Lord. If the Bible is yours, please feel free to underline. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Verse 7, but they had no child. If the Bible is yours, also underline, but. But they had no child. Because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving the priest as priest before God, in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into, went into the temple of the Lord and ten. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. And then an angel of the Lord, the Bible is yours underlined then, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense and when Zechariah saw him he was troubled and fear fell upon him but the angel said to him do not be afraid Zechariah for your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth and the Bible continues to line out what the assignment of John shall be in just the end of verse 17 it says and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And he begins to give details. And the angel said to Zechariah, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad things. But behold, you'll be mute and not be able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Bible is yours underline in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them and they perceived he had seen a vision in the temple, but he had seen better than a vision for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And so it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house to be with his wife, Elizabeth. And now after those days, Elizabeth conceived, blessed be God, and she hid herself for five months, saying, I want us to read that together. She hid herself for five months, saying, thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Verse 26, it says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women. But he said, when she saw this, she was troubled, saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall, you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, or to his kingdom, or of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to Jesus, how can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, could underline the next phrases. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, number one. The power of the highest will overshadow you, number two. Therefore, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren. Verse 37, I want us to read it together. For with God... Nothing will be impossible. One more time. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father, we thank you for your word today. We pray that you would speak to us in accents clear and still. That when we leave this place, it shall not be as if we've heard from man. But all of us, with the exception of none, will leave this place knowing that we have truly been in the presence of our Lord and Savior. Therefore, speak to us today, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 
So that's just a bit of the summary of the story that we want to look at, and the title is God on Time. As you read these portions of scripture, it strikes as something that is very interesting because it starts with the story of Elizabeth, Mama John, and Zacharias, Baba John, all right? And then there's John the Baptist, who we all know. And then there's Mama Jesus and Baba Jesus. Sounds weird saying it that way, huh? But there's Mama Jesus and Baba Jesus, Mary and Joseph, and then there's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Um, there are a couple of parallels that we can, we can try to line out of these things. As we go throughout these things, I want you to have three things in your mind as we look at God on time. And I want you to write them down so that you can keep remembering them throughout as we share. And hopefully, after we've left this place, you'll still continue to remember them. Now, the first thing in those three things is God's plan. God's plan. God's plan. The second thing is God's time. God's time. The third thing is God's way. God's way. So the first thing is God's plan. The second thing, God's time. And the third thing, God's way. It's important for you to remember those things. And though they look similar, it's important for you to keep rehashing them in your mind over and over again throughout your life that there's such a thing as God's plan and there's such a thing as God's way and there's God's time and there's such a thing as God's way. That order is not very, very important, but if you put them that way, it makes a little bit more of sense. Back to our story of today. So it is important, as we started to say the things we underlined, it is important that we realize that there was a man who was called Zacharias. Zacharias was no ordinary man. He was a priest. He was serving in the division called Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, also came down from the priestly, um, she, from the priestly line. Okay. So she was of priestly lineage. So this was a priest married to a woman of priestly lineage um, of the uh, daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. The third thing about them, uh, well, let's call it the second thing about them, because the first thing is that both of them were already coming from um, lineages that were, um, were let's, let's call it approved, approved lineages of God because these were priests that were serving in the temple. These were people who were coming from a lineage or generations that were already blessed. These were priests. They were people that had been called into the service of God. The second thing about them is that they were not just coming from a lineage that seemed or was approved by God at that time. They were also living lives that were approved of by God. It says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. These were people that were coming from an approved line and they were living approved lives. Everything about them was seemed to make God happy. It was as if God used to look at them and smile. Do you know those people that you would imagine God looks at and, and he smiles at them? Would you imagine such kind of a thing? One example is Job in the Bible. The Bible says that when the sons of God came to present themselves before God, that the enemy, the devil, the accuser of brethren, was also there presenting himself right there. And when he's saying all these things, the Lord is asking him, where have you come from? And he's saying, I've come from just going around to and fro, so and so and so. And then the Lord is asking, have you noticed <laughs> my servant Job? Have you just, <laughs> might it have crossed your mind? Have you seen, has he caught your attention? Because he certainly has caught my own attention. It seems there are, there are those people who catch the attention of God. It is such an encouragement for me as a believer living in this present day and time to think that for me, it is the believer that catches the attention of God. Now it is no longer by works. You see, for Job, it was by works because he was living a certain kind of lifestyle at that time. That was before Jesus Christ came to die for all of us. But now, prophet, the prophet Isaiah will remind us that even our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. In other words, if you were to stand in front of God because of your works, if you think your works are the things that will make God be happy, that you on your best day, God is looking at that and he's still saying filthy rags. But... God is looking at you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so that causes you to be righteous. When God looks at you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it causes you to appear righteous. It puts a smile on his face. So who puts a smile on the face of God in this day and age? The believer that has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Are you here and you're a believer? You put a smile on the face of God. Are you here and you're not a believer? Well, you're in the right place this morning. Hallelujah. 
Let's continue. So these people who are, who are living twice approved lives, okay? But, there is a but, we underline the but in verse 7, it says, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So there was a problem of Elizabeth and then there was a problem of the two of them. The problem with Elizabeth at that time that the Bible tells us is that she was barren. And then the problem of the two of them is that they were well advanced in years. So even if Elizabeth's barrenness were to be reversed, they were also still well advanced in years. You remember the story of Sarah and, and Abraham, which Bishop J.B. was reminding us the other day? Being well advanced in years was a problem. That uh, still is, you know, when it comes to that department. But um, there was a problem for them. They were twice approved, but they also were twice troubled, okay? So there was a problem with Elizabeth. And even that, if that problem would be or were to be sorted, there was still something wrong with both of them, which is they were both well advanced in years. But I want you to keep remembering that there is such a thing as God's plan. Same as God's plan. So the story continues. The angel appears before uh, the man, Baba John. And we have already read it. We're not going to read it again. And the angel brings greetings and brings the good news. He's saying to Elijah, up to, to Baba John, to Zachariah, that your prayer has been answered. You see, he's already inside burning the incense. He's offering worship on behalf of the people at that time. He's not particularly praying, or it's not mentioned here that he's particularly praying for a son. I would imagine that's a prayer they have been making together in their couple devotion. That's a prayer that they had been making for years upon years, and now I don't think they were making that prayer any much longer or any more actively. But there's such a thing as those prayers that just remain in your heart. They just continue to linger inside of your heart. I think that's what was happening. And so the angel comes and says to them, hey, your prayer has been answered. And then Zechariah is like, how, I, how, how could that be? First, I would imagine he's like, what, what prayer are you talking about? Oh, yeah, that prayer. Okay. Ah, if, that, that, if that is what you're, you're talking about, then um, I think there's a problem there. Because the conversation that he's asking, Zachariah says to the angel in verse 18, he says, how shall I know this? I'm a man, I'm an old man, and my wife is also well advanced in years. So um, I have a problem, and my wife also have a problem. We are double troubled. Okay. So he says to the angel that, and the angel is answering and saying, my name is Gabriel. I am the one who stands in the presence of God. In other words, to answer the question of Zechariah's doubt, the answer that God gives is that I said it. Now let me try and bring it closer to our African context. Many times growing up in your own homes, you'd be asked by your moms to do things my mom is in the house, you'd be asked by your mom to do things, and sometimes you would not understand for the life of you why you are the one that has to go out and do that thing that she's telling you. One of the chores that I used to hate with all my heart growing up was kupepeta jiko. Hated it with all my heart. Hated it. To this day, nikisikia rufu ya jiko jamani and kera and chafua roni nina trauma. <laughs> but I, I'm the last born in our family and even though we grew up as many of us together with many of my extended family members I still come among the last at that time that I was there so I don't know why adults would imagine that it is a fun thing for a young boot that's just going to be here it keeps you, it's not fun let me just say it on behalf of the young people but anyway, your mom is trying to cultivate some kind of you know, responsibility in you. Anajua hata nikirushwa Nairobi saizi mahali na hakuna gas na hakuna inaitwa koko gas. Na hakuna mafuta ya taa na hakuna nini. Kuna makaa. Naweza nikainama na niko na life skill. Inaitwa pepeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right? But anyway, my mom would say such things. And I would ask maybe sometimes, maybe once or twice. I didn't ask it much because the one time I would ask it, maybe I was met with, you know, some good treatment of the fivefold ministry. And um, if I would ask, the answer would be, Kwa sababu ni mesema. In English, it is because I said so. All right? And that just lets you know, kuna wenye hii nyumba, Nasio wewe. So wewe enda ufanye kazi. Kuna mwenye kazi, nasio wewe, ni mesema ufanye. If you go to your office and your boss gives you some assignment, and you're thinking, kwa ni mipe kiyake ndi onafanya nga kazi. Mimi, and then your boss says, I hear what you're saying, but I said, you do it. You have two options. You either quit or you go and do it. 
And these economic times are not really giving you the first options. You know? So you just go and you do the thing. In other words, when somebody says, I said so, it means I am the one that is calling the shots. You know? So back to the story of Zechariah, when he's asking the question in verse 18, he said, how shall I know it is this? I am an old man. The answer that Gabriel gives, I think in summary, would be God saying to this man, because God is the one that said so. I know, I know, I know you're old. I know your wife is barren. I know you're both well advanced in years, but I said so. Hallelujah. It gives me such a great delight to just keep remembering every time or for this story to remind me that regardless of where I am right now, that there is a God who can override the way things are done just by the fact that he can say so. Hallelujah. It is such an encouragement to look at where I am and to look at what day of the year it is on this 12th day of December in 2021, the year that really is the year of mounting up. You might not seen, have seen a lot of mounting up, but just to remember that there is a God who overrides. Ah! He can override just by, I said so. I know you have come with your own folder that is full of reasons why God cannot, why it cannot happen. But God is saying, I said so. It can happen. Hallelujah. Let's continue to read that. And the, the angel continues to say all these things and says to Zachariah, but because I don't want you to ask more questions and then do what I am trying to do, I'm going to just, you know, just remain silent. Um, imagine the conversation that was there when he went back home, trying to explain to his wife. So, babe, <laughs> the craziest thing happened today in the temple. Um, so I was doing the thing and, you know, Gabriel just came down and, you know, I didn't recognize him because he didn't quite have wings. I expected that Gabriel would have a wingspan, you know, because if Gabriel had come with wings, it would be easy to, for Zechariah to not ask, who are you? Why? If you came with wings, if, if somebody with wings appeared to you today, a white being with wings, like they are depicted, you would not doubt. But if um, an angel like the one standing in front of you right now, what to come and tell you, God is going to do it, Mama Ima. God is going to do it. What you're asking him, God is going to do it. He'd be like, you don't understand. I have dealt with this thing for a long time. You don't get it. So, God to sort that or to remedy that situation says to, to him, So when he goes home, he's trying to explain that to the wife. He's like, so this guy came and he says it's Gabriel. <laughs> Yo. And he said, I'm not going to be able to speak. You know what caused Zechariah to believe? The fact that from that moment on, he did not speak anymore. He's like, oh, if he can take away my voice, he's most probably is who he says he is. Man, I don't want a sign to have to believe God. I don't know about you, but I really don't want to be forced to be mute. I don't want to keep asking God, God, if it is really, really, really you, please, please, I'm going to put you through the fleece test that the Bible talks about. No, I don't want to have to, I don't want my heart to be so hardened to God that when he speaks to me the first time I don't believe him. I want to live in what other people might say. You, you are living in, in, in utopia. You won't have to be Yeah, because if God said it, what can God not do? I want to be so childlike in faith that even if you're on your way telling your child, you're on your way out to Navaviatu, Unamambia, Sawasita Kuacha, and Davaviatu. Akirudi uko ndani na wewe unajua vizuri kwa kweli unamwacha. Akiingia uko bedroom. Anakuja na viatu anashindwa. Even when you when you mistreat them like that, it's mistreatment. If you mistreat them like that, if tomorrow you come and you tell them the same thing, they have this childlike faith of believing that you really cannot lie to me. You 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 have a good plan for me. God's plan I don't want my heart to be so hardened by the things that have not happened the way I want them to happen because there's another thing called God's time. Bwana sifiwe. Bwana iswa sifiwe. Because today might not be the time for me to carry the child and go with them outside, but a day is coming I am preparing for them. A whole December holiday where I'll just carry them and go with them to a place and another place and another place. What I na mimi had you achoke. I was at the store the other day at TRM here, and um, I was, uh, the, there were two parents, a man and his wife, I would imagine, it's man and his wife, and they were shopping for something, they were window shopping at one of the stores there, and their, their child, the young child was there, and um, when they came in, they found me in the store, 
When they came in, the child was very excited. Mom, 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 I want this one, I want this one. I said, okay, you can get it. And they got that one. Mom, I also want this one. I got it. I really want this one. He got it. In a very small young guy, I think just maybe learned to talk recently. Um, he had two items in the basket. And then now the mom was going around the store looking for now things for her own home. Christmas decorations, I don't know what else. So she was just going around. And as soon as the child had gotten what he wanted, the child was like, Mom, let's go home. Mom, I'm tired of staying here. Mom, we go. And the child complained and complained. And the mom was like, now next time I will not bring you. Because when I live in the house, it's a problem. When I come with you, you want to go back to the house. So next time, I'll not come with you. I want you to know that walini pata hapo, na walini hapo kwa yoduka. They were not there for that long. I don't like shopping, so I don't take long in stores. Ingia kama robot, unengia, unafanya, kenyu, unatoka, unatoka. But... They, 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 just the way children are, and we can learn a lot by just looking at children and how they relate with things and with people and their parents and so on and so forth. It's, it's just the same, the same with us, but they don't lose this childlike wonder. I said there is a plan. The parent still has plans to take their child out. It might not be today, but there is a time that is also coming. One of the things that interests me about this story is that there is actually... It was the plan of God to bring Jesus Christ, who we are looking at in just a minute. There was, it was the plan of God to bring Jesus Christ. But before Jesus Christ, there was a plan. I want you to remember that when the birth of John the Baptist is being announced, the angel explains who John the Baptist is going to be. That tells you there is a plan. Okay? It was not just another ordinary boy being born. There was a plan for the man that was just about to be born. There was a plan. I want you to think to yourself. As we look at God's time, why will it be that somebody who God has such great, intricate, complete plans for will take so long to arrive? No, think about it. God had clearly very well detailed, detailed plans of John the Baptist's life and his assignment and his mission and his purpose. So why then would it be that? Why would he take so long to come? Everybody was done waiting for him to come. But God was not done. Because he had a plan for him, but everything that is planned for also has its time for execution. If you're watching movies, then you will know that um, if they want to shoot at a target, there's a certain time for you to shoot. If you shoot too early, it will miss the target, maybe because of the winds and other factors. If you shoot too late, then you miss the target. There's a set time. It's a plan for you to do it, but there's a set time for things to happen. Hallelujah. So just the fact that God has planned for something and has let you in on his plans by way of prophecy or the promise that he has given to you through his word does not mean that he will do it at any time. I need you to align your thoughts to the truth that just because God has planned for it, it means that God himself has the time for it to happen. I want you to imagine if John the Baptist were to be the honeymoon baby of, John, of Zacharias and Elizabeth. These people were old, yeah? They are old. Imagine kama sazile wangewana ndiyo angepata honeymoon baby. In their first year of marriage like this, John, pap. It means by the time Jesus Christ is coming, many years later, John the Baptist will be such an old man, such an old man, he will, not probably, he will probably not be able to go into the Jordan to baptize Jesus. He'd probably not be able to do the kind of ministry that he was doing parallel to the ministry of Jesus at the time that he was there with his own disciples. If you continue reading in scripture, it will let you know that John had his own disciples doing his own kind of ministry, letting people know, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. The same, ministry, the same message that Jesus was preaching as well. He needed to come at that time. He needed to be peers with Jesus. There was just about a six month difference between the two of them. Just about, give or take. They needed to be peers so that they grew up strong together so that they have the same kind of energy so that when Jesus is in Capernaum and then moving and going to some place to do like Gennesaret that there is actually a John who also matches the same kind of vigor also going around the place. He, there was a time planned for him. Maybe some of the things you're asking God for or that the Lord has promised to you are things that are actually coming, they are God's idea for you or for your family or even for this nation, Kenya, but the time has not yet come. And so what does that usher us into? Into God's way. There is God's plan and there is God's time of carrying out his plan and even when his time has come, he will not do it the way we want. There will be God's way of doing things. Hallelujah. 
Because when the angel is asking, we'll see that in the story of Mary in just a few minutes, uh, Elizabeth goes and hides herself as they're having the conversation and he's like, okay, okay, uh, baby, imagine me, I believe you. You came to the house when you're mute? I believe what that angel said. And so they did the thing and she got pregnant and the Bible says she conceived and she hid herself for five months and she was repeating the same chorus for five months that this is what the Lord has done to remedy my unfortunate situation. This is how the Lord has dealt with me. You see, sometimes you just need to keep remembering what the Lord has done. Just need to keep reminding yourself, this is what the Lord has done. I love Psalm 103 when it says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. It will do you some great service to remember what the Lord has done. It will do you a great service to remember what God can do. It will do you some great service to keep remembering that I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded because how do you know him? Because you have seen him. By reason of use, by reason of belief and trust in the past, he has come through many times before. And so I might be standing in a difficult place, but I know whom I have believed. Hallelujah. It might be difficult and hard, but I know whom I have believed. I love that the Apostle Paul in as in 2 Corinthians, is talking about how where we are standing right now might be a difficult place, but we know I am hard-pressed on every side, but I am not crushed. I am persecuted, but not abandoned. I am struck down, but not destroyed. I am reminded of the fact that even though things have gotten a little bit messy, they are not completely ruined. There is still some chance for God to come in because there is God's plan and it is going to happen in his time and it's going to happen his way. Hallelujah. Or oh, will I bring some encouragement to somebody that has been waiting on the Lord for some time? I want to remind you that God has a solid plan over your life. Jeremiah reminds us by saying it in Jeremiah 29, 11, which we know how to quote that I know. Who is I? God. Know the plans I have for you. There are plans and they are for you. So you are on God's mind. When God is speaking to the children of Israel at that time in captivity, he's saying to them, you're not going to get out of captivity right now. If you read just before verse 11 of Jeremiah 29, he's saying to them, I want you, there are false prophets that have come and they are lying to you, they are telling you the problems are coming to an end. You're getting out of exile. That's not true. God's true message is that you're going to remain in captivity for a little while longer, about maybe 70 or so more years. I want you to build homes in this place. In this place of captivity, I want you to thrive. I want you to grow in this place of captivity. I want you to expand, stretch the tent of your dwelling. Do not be afraid. I want you to just increase yourself. Get comfortable in this place, but not forever. Just keep remembering that God has a plan. He's telling them, let your children marry. In fact, marry out your wives, your children to, to get wives. Help them to get wives in this place. Let them intermarry. Mutatoka lakini siyo sasa. I want you to remember that I know the plans I have for you. There are plans for good and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. In other words, my plan will get you to tomorrow. And when you're standing in tomorrow, there will be tomorrow's tomorrow. When you're standing in tomorrow's tomorrow, there will be another tomorrow. So long as you're standing in today, my plan is to get you to another tomorrow. Just trust me. Hallelujah. If you're feeling like you're at the end of the road, I want to let you know that at the end of your road, there's another tomorrow. There's another mile that is stretching out. The carpet is yet getting rolled in front of you because God has a good, solid plan for you. If you're feeling like you're at a place, there's no growth. Like, it really could not get worse than this. I want to let you know that God still has a plan. And his plan will be rolled out at his time in his way. So the one that has called you into this place is faithful to carry you to the place that he wants to take you. This place might be tasteless it might be difficult while you're standing here, but I want you to know that we have one who Isaiah speaks about, whose name is God with us, Emmanuel, and he's not going to leave us or forsake us. He's present with us in our suffering. The Bible says he is close to the brokenhearted. If you're brokenhearted, guess who is right next to you? I love that we were reminded last year during the time for social distancing when it came for the first time that there is one person who will not social distance and his name is Jesus. He is present with us right there in our suffering, in our difficult moments. You can trust him. Don't give him the cold, silent treatment. He's right there with you. Talk to him. Hallelujah. 
the story of Mary continues. And the story of Mary, we've already touched on it, and it says the angel appears to Mary. Mary is just an ordinary woman at that time. She's a virgin woman. In that day and culture, virginity was not such a crazy, unusual thing. It wasn't unusual, actually. It was expected. It was required of young ladies to be found in that pure form. A virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Moses of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the Lord said, rejoice, highly favored one. And she was troubled in spirit. She did not understand this kind of greeting. What happened? is that he says to her, I'm going to give you a child and you're going to name his name Jesus and continues to line out, this is who this child will be. In other words, God is saying, even you, Mary, I have a plan for the child I'm giving you. I want you to imagine that by the time you're living in this place, whatever God has placed in your hand is planned for. God has a solid plan for your life, for your children, he has a solid life plan for this nation. That's why you cannot allow yourself to say that Nimefika Muisho throw, you, throw in the towel. Now I don't want anything to do with anything. No. God has a solid plan. Ephesians 2.10 will remind us of the same. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared for us long before we were born. That before you entered into the scene of life, God had already prepared, pre-planned for you. It is much better a thing when you arrive at a party that they have been planning for you. You've RSVP'd, so there is a seat for you. God has said that by the time you are coming to the scene of life, I had set a seat in life for you. How we kwa plants za wenyewe. And me, no, God does not have anything to me. Mungu how? How? He has a plan for you. He's thinking about you. If you're seated in the service today and you're feeling like you're at the end of the road, I want to remind you today that God has a plan for you. The fact that you're still here lets you know that your seat is still here. Hallelujah. Kuna mpango. Ana mpango mwema. Bwana sifiwe. So the Lord appears to, to Mary and says to her that the child that I'm giving you, I have a plan for him as well. And Mary is saying, okay, I don't know a man yet. And the Lord says three things. And this is just the last point of God's way of doing things. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Okay? And the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he says, now indeed, indeed your relative Elizabeth has also received a son for her in old age. I want you to understand also that in part of God's way and God's time of doing this was also God allowing that Elizabeth and her husband Zacharias be inconvenienced for just a little bit because their inconvenience was going to serve to make the miracle believable for Mary. Bonasifiwe. If again he had been a honeymoon baby, I'm talking about John the Baptist, if he had come just naturally, it looks like such a natural thing. If that were the case, then I want to bring it to you that there wouldn't be a lot of material that now the angel is bringing to Mary with. The one who was called barren and old, now is, it, it wasn't a spectacular thing. But now it was a spectacular thing. Because it was a relative. Do you know what my relatives were? Ah, come on. So you know about your relatives. So you know the ones who are not able to, I don't know, get children. So you know the ones who are not, whose children are not, they don't amount to much. Maybe, maybe it might be your children who your relatives are talking about like that. But I want you to imagine that the same way that God had a plan for this inconveniencing situation for Mama and Baba John, God has a solid plan for whatever place you find yourself in today. Hallelujah. He's thinking about it. And he's not just roughly thinking about it. He has a solid plan for it. Because he comes and says, in other words, number one, how it's going to happen is that I am the one that is doing it. Remember when God is saying, I told, I'm the one, I said so. When he's saying to Zechariah, I said so. God is saying to Mary, number one, because I said so. I'm the one who is doing it. Number two, I also need you to understand that I am not new to this. I've been doing it for a while now. I've been opening wombs for a while now. I've been doing crazy miracles for a while now. I've been bringing the divine to humanity for a while now. I can do because the raw material for God to do things is nothing. Hallelujah. He does not need anything that is known to man to create things. He can just do things. That is the God that we believe in. I love that Pastor Solomon likes to say he is a God of limitless possibilities and miracle surprises that cannot be counted. 
You cannot put God in a box. You can't label him safely contained. No, you have to let him lead the way. You have to trust that he has a plan. You have to trust that he has a time for carrying out his plan. And you have to trust that he has a way of doing it. For one person, he might decide to let them go with their husband and just pursue the natural means like Elizabeth and her husband Zacharias and they get a child. For another person, he's just going to give her an immaculate birth, having known no man, and just put a child right inside of her. Do not limit God. Oh, if you forget everything else that we've said, I hope you don't. But if you do, I pray that you'll remember that there is a plan that God has. In fact, God, Mugonjoroge, Reverend Mugonjoroge reminded us the other day that God intends to bless you more than you're willing to receive the blessing. The idea of prospering and blessing and increasing you, of giving you a better life in Jesus Christ, the idea of salvation was not your own. It is God's. When you're asking God, oh, save my child, save my son, save my spouse, my husband and my wife, oh, save this nation. It is not your idea. The idea of salvation is God's. And so he desires to carry it out much more than you are willing to pray and fast about it. It doesn't matter how much we are doing for it. But I want you to remember that it is his plan. And God's plan will be carried out at his own time. Because he has, his plan includes the time. Write any time too early and it will not accomplish the purpose for which he sent it for. Any time too late and it will not accomplish the purpose. But right at the time, then he has hit it precisely. And God never misses the mark. Hallelujah. The Bible reminds us in the book of Isaiah and says that as the rain comes down and the dew and comes down to the earth and it gives rain and, and dew and all these things, making bread for the eater and seed for the sower, so is my word. When it comes down, it shall not return to me void. It must accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. It must accomplish its purpose. Whatever God has spoken, whatever plan he has released, it has its own time. When it comes, it will linger until its time has arrived. When Isaiah the prophet is speaking about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9 from verse 6, saying for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And he's it says, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Um, and of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice from this time forward, even forever. Again, the Lord adds, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. For all those people who might read that and think, how shall it be? The Lord is saying, I shall do it. The same way he's saying about to Elizabeth and to, and to um, Zacharias, I shall do it. The same way he's saying to Mary, I shall do it. The same way he's saying to you and to me this morning, I shall do it. When Isaiah is speaking these things, it continues to linger for another long time. For another long time until finally it comes to pass in the name of Jesus. And those things that the Lord promised of Jesus coming to do, him being a wonderful counselor, he's still doing in this day. If you're feeling like you're troubled and at some corner you are so confused, I want to bring you some good news. There is a wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. His counsel can be trusted. He's a wonderful counselor. If you're feeling like you're in a place where you, you don't understand what is happening and you need somebody to intervene in your situation because you're hard-pressed, I bring you some good news. There is a mighty God. Hallelujah. If you're feeling like you're troubled in your mind, I bring you some good news. There is a prince of peace. And if you're feeling like you're alone and there's nobody to give you help, I bring you some good news. There is an everlasting father. Hallelujah. And he's in the house today. If you can just lift up your voice and just say, Lord Jesus, I need you to come through for me this morning. You are on time. I want to trust your plan. I want to trust your hand. I want to trust your way. I want to trust you. I want to trust you, Lord Jesus. This morning, things might not be working out. Where we are in the year, I'm looking at the things that you promised to me and my family, even to this nation, and they don't seem to be happening, but I am not faced as I leave this service today. Lord Jesus, I am reminded in me that it is your plan to actually carry out these good things. It is your will and your plan that we prosper in all ways, even as our health prospers. Lord Jesus, this morning we are trusting you. As we cry out to you, as we lift up our voices, we pray that you would stir up our faith to believe even more that you have a plan. It is not our plan. It is not our thought. It is not our idea. It is your very own. You have placed it in our hearts. You placed it in us through your word and through your servants over the years. Lord, it is your plan and your plan you will carry out in your own time and you will carry it out 
in your own way. Lord, we pray for patience to wait on you this morning as we get into these festivities, Lord, just to remember that you actually stuck to your plan. You actually stuck to your plan and you came through. You gave us a Lord and a Savior. I pray that we will not forget that this morning there is a wonderful counselor. There is a Prince of Peace. There is a mighty God. There is an everlasting Father and he's right here in the house today. Lord, for everyone that cries out to you for a need, I pray that you would come through for them in such specificity, oh God, in such directness that them that are crying for counsel, that the wonderful counselor would appear for them, that them that are crying out for intervention, that the mighty God would come through for them, them that are crying out to you, Lord Jesus, peaceless, that the Prince of Peace would come through for them, and them that need hope, oh God, and strength, that the everlasting Father would appear for them, giving them comfort, oh God, reminding them that you are our source and also our sustainer. So we submit ourselves to you. We pray, Lord Jesus, in this house, if there be anyone that came to you crying out, Lord, feeling like they are at the end of the road, we speak new strength to them this morning. Anyone that is feeling hopeless, we speak the hope of God inside of them in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're here, you've never given your life to Jesus. All these things and more can belong to you this day. You can put a smile on God's face just like every other believer this morning by just accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you want to give your life to Jesus, if you lift up your hand, we'll see it quickly and we'll help you make this prayer. Are you here? Are you in the house? You'd like to give your life to Jesus. If you lift your hand quickly, we will see it. We'll pray together with you. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your sons and for your daughters. We call them blessed this morning in the name of Jesus. We pray that your mercy, your grace, and your goodness will pursue us even to the very end the praise of your name and to the fame of your kingdom, even to the shame of the enemy. We receive it to thanksgiving today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your plan. Thank you for your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.